Hi there, I'm Katherine Given at Lux Interiors and Design, and thank you for tuning into our Collab Lab segment on Design TV. Today, I'm so excited to discuss one of the most inspiring collaborations I have seen recently with two companies that really consider ideas like craftsmanship, quality, decoration at every level of what they do. So with me today, we have Lizzie Dea, co-founder of Fromental who makes the most beautiful wall coverings, as well as Valentin Gou, the president of Rink, which is the French furniture and fabrication company, which has been around since 1841, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys, hi. Thank you for having Hello. us. So I'm so excited to chat a little bit um, about, with you guys, but what I love about your companies and what you guys do besides these you know, one of a kind designs is, the handcrafted techniques that you are still using today, which I think you know, really needs to be celebrated. Um, and I know we'll, we'll talk about that more um, when we get into the new design, the classicist sketchbook. But first, tell me how you guys came together. Did you know each other? How did this sort of collaboration come about? It seems that we, our orbits kind of crossed just at the right moment in, in time and space, it, it actually, it seems so natural now that there's no moment for me when I go, yes, we met exactly at this point. It just seems that we've known each other forever. Valentin? Yeah, yeah, I, actually, actually we, we've met uh, through a few like uh, design events in, in, in Paris and in London. And every time we were like, talking a lot and really enjoying, you know, each other's conversation uh, with Lizzie and with with team. Um, and um, yeah, for, for a few years we were like, uh, talking about things and wanting to do something together. And uh, and I think that's, yeah, just how it started. Okay, we, so we worked good. on a few little projects together, didn't we? Just uh, exhibitions right. and things like that. And, um, yeah, for, and then... for, Paris, for Paris Decor Art, yeah. um, where, where Fromental was doing a wallpaper, our wall decor, and we created like a, a paneling around it. But it was like collaborating, but each in each uh, special field though. So. And I know, you know, so much goes into creating, you know, all of your designs, but for this, you know, particular wall covering, where did you guys begin? I know some of the inspiration comes from, you know, Rink's wood carvings and molds, right? But like, what was sort of the beginning when you were talking about the design? Yeah, so, so actually, actually uh, what happened was very uh, fluid, I'd say. Um, I, I, I was um, going to my workshop, my main workshop in the south of France, uh, where we do have all the uh, wood carving um, workshop. And um, my team was working on this very interesting classical uh, classical furniture collection and uh, a few a few beautiful pieces. And um, they were sketching first all of the ornaments full scale on uh, like a, a piece of of, um, of paper, basically. And I was like, this is beautiful because it it, it had these two lines uh, of different colors to uh, underline the depth of the molding. And I thought it was like, in the meantime, very classical, of course, because it was classical ornaments, but also very pop. And so I just took a picture and I, I, I WhatsApped it to, to Lizzie and, and team in London saying, this should like, this would make a beautiful wallpaper. What do you think? And like the answer in 10 minutes was, yes, let's do it. Yes. <laughs> well, when we, when we see good draftsmanship, we go nuts. Because as Valentin said, it was executed fluidly, beautifully by somebody who just draws very, very well and can convey the meaning of what they are drawing beautifully. And 
it was obvious when uh, Valentin then gave us the layout of the intended wallpaper, it was so beautifully laid out. It was a perfect wallpaper straight away. We did nothing but work on colorways with Valentin and then produce the wallpaper. The wallpaper was entirely designed by Hank and it was perfect first or oh, we saw it perfect first time i don't know how much work went on in the background first of all, but it uh, just had, seemed we had, like poof. we had to redesign a few ornaments and to add some and to take out some others so basically we we went into all of the classic uh, repertoire of the french 18 and early 19th century so you would have a bit of uh, louis the 15 a bit of louis the 16 and some empire uh, like egyptomania uh, influence but then it was all just a little bit of like rearranging and uh, and it was nice like that, I think. That, that, that's, that is the joy of two craftsmen led and art design led companies working together because it really is the speciality of both just seamlessly working together. And I think craftsmen understand each other. Yeah. You know, you. we are in a way, it sounds a bit silly in the world of design to say that, but we are very much stripped of ego. The most important thing is, is to execute something beautifully. That is the only mission. And it's not to put your name, it's not to say who designed, it's to create something beautiful. And then when craftsmen do that together, it yeah. usually works yeah. very freely. I, I, I think actually we share that, that vision for, for our work and this is kind of like a um, anti-narcissistic approach. Uh, the important <laughs> yes. thing for us is the art. We don't we yes. don't care about you know being prima donnas or stuff. I, I always say that like the, the biggest chance we have at Rink is that we we our collective name is the one of someone who's dead since 160 years. So there is no place for ego. We just do beautiful things, and and there is one collective name for all. Yeah, mm. I absolutely agree. Although Fromentel is, a, is a, again is a family name, but it's somebody you know, somebody I knew who passed when I was three years old. So it's it doesn't have my name. It doesn't have my husband's name. It's we're Fromentalians. That's how we call our, <laughs> our team, Fromentalians. That's really good. I like it's that. It's cool, huh? <laughs> so Valentine, just talk to us a little bit. You know, for some people who don't know, you know, I'm seeing these beautiful drawings, right, of of, of moldings and you know different. And I know Rink has sort of several arms, but do you mind just telling us a little bit about, you know, the company and how you are using these things, you know, um, um, and integrating them, you know, on yeah, a daily basis? Sure. Uh, like a small introduction of the company, so that's, that's right, going sure. to be uh, hard because as you say, we have many <laughs> yeah, one minute. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, elevator pitch, let's go for that. Uh, so as I say, it's a 180 years old company. Um, basically, we have an arm in every little part of French decorative arts. Um, we, we do we have workshops uh, doing both meal work and um, like cabinet making and we also have our own interior design studio uh, very specialized in the in French classic stuff but um, it doesn't mean that we cannot uh, rethink our view of French classicism and that what we did with this wallpaper bringing a little bit of pop culture into classicism Oh, I like that. And then, you know, Lizzie, I have to say, like Fromental, just you guys do color so, so well. And so I kind of am interested. I think I think the classicist sketchbook comes in. Is it six colors? But can you discuss sort of how you refine them and, you know, how, how you get to what? How, how do you choose? I just can't. Okay, imagine. It, in <laughs> this case, it well, again, when we work with somebody special, we have done a few you know, we've done lots of lovely collaborations and, and, and they all have their unique points, but there's something when somebody delivers a drawing and it's so well executed that you get the essence of what that is trying to be, what, what is being put across. And when I saw the black and white drawings and the color rendering, the first colorway that uh, Valentin Tim had worked on, I immediately thought, um, Festival of London, 1950s, and I was transported into a world of colour which was really quite strong, and I knew exactly what the colourways should be. It just talked to me, that whole design, just immediately, the colours just fell one after the other, because it was the strength of de the design itself, it was really talking, it was saying exactly what it was, and then the colours come. It doesn't happen very often, but when something's so well executed, it's 
yes, the colors just come and you just know what they're meant to be. And I instantly adopted them as well. And I, I, I was mm -hmm. seeing exactly where each of them should go. Like the green one for me was uh, uh, a townhouse in the, in the Upper East Side. And the, the gold one was in Italy somewhere in the 70s. And, you know, I, I had really a place for a location for each of them. That's great. Because I was going to ask you about, you know, now that you have, you know, this beautiful wall covering, like I was going to say, how do, how do you envision it, you know, using it in a space or have you used it in a space or, or what well, do you think? First, I'm trying to convince my wife to buy a new apartment in Paris to use it. <laughs> uh, there you need more walls. <laughs> yeah, I clearly need more walls. What about but, you, Lizzie? How would you use it? Is it sort of in oh, a sort of more, like, jewel box space? No. <laughs> okay, a bigger space. <laughs> I mean, I look, I love small spaces, but you know, wallpaper is it's got scale. And with the wallpaper, again, that's so interesting when, when you walk afar from it, and then when you walk close, you see the execution of it, the fact that it's all hand painted. I think it's always lovely to have it in a corridor or a room where you can really walk past things, walk towards it or past. And you just get a different feeling. It's just, it's always moving. It's wonderful in a small space, of course, but to really interact with the, decor with the decorative arts, you have to be able to walk around them and be within them. So, I mean, obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. a large space I, I is I totally wonderful. agree. I totally agree. I, actually, all the aside, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really buying a new apartment, and <laughs> and I, I have plans as a the gold one to be the entrance. I think like oh. you, op you open the door and you see the gold one with, with like a nice little con console, maybe some you know mm -hmm. vases and, and and stuff like that, and it's very dramatic. It's beautiful. It re really creates like a a sense of uh, of like something is happening in this apartment. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So and we I did that we did that in Paris, you know. Uh, right. we, we've been under like a, an, an invasion of, of, uh, of grey and beige and, and the worst of all grey in Paris for the last uh, 20 years. So, so we need colours in our lives. You have to be the flag bearer for that for us, Valentin. I agree with you, Valentin. And I just want to touch on because both of you are doing things that, so, that really doesn't exist. You know, you're using these very handcrafted, you know, one of a kind techniques. Um, that's why I think it was such an amazing meeting of the minds, you know, because as you said, you guys were on the same page, but can you talk about the process a little, a little bit, maybe Lizzie, just like, you know, hand painting these designs and sure. you know, how it takes, I mean, because it really is so, it's quite labor intensive, right? Absolutely. So, I mean, the drawings that were given to us were incredibly high res. They were crisp. There was nothing to do to them. They were absolutely perfect. So what we could concentrate on was um, preparing the samples in our London studio. So I personally painted the first samples um, and filmed them, filmed the painting of the samples, um, prepared all the colorways so that our studios knew exactly how the handwriting should look. So what I wanted to do was not reinterpret um, the, the cartoons that um, Valentin had given me and, you know, respecting them, not putting a twist on them, just really respecting them and thinking, how would these have been rendered by a draftsman? How does a draftsman draw? How does a draftsman paint? Or how does a draftsman use ink? So I tried to recreate that in the movement of the paintbrush, get the colorways down, and then our studios are so good at understanding and capturing the feeling of the painting style and they reproduce that really, really beautifully. Yeah. But it was I, I, very I important. Really, you really got it actually, because as you say, it's, it's, a, it's a draftman gesture. It, 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 it's, not, it's not like someone who's sitting on the table and, and, and going with something very precise. You know, yeah. uh, it's, um, it's just like one perfect gesture and, and um, yeah. And someone who's always like uh, up, actually, not sitting. So it's, uh, yes. I think you really got it. And what, what's interesting is that I usually stand up when I paint because, you know, you, you need the, the, your body to move you know, to create a, a beautiful line. And our, uh, our artists all stand. And they stand at a really good angle so they don't hurt their backs, but they never sit when they paint. They all stand. So that's where there's that wonderful fluidity. Mm, certainly. And is there anything else you want to add just, you know, Valentin, whether it's, you know, handcrafting furniture or hand painting, 
you know, wallpapers, sort of why, you know, this legacy or this heritage is, is still important, you know, in, in design? Well, for me, doing this wallpaper is very, very uh, interesting because most of our custom pieces, um, you know, they are extremely pricey. And uh, especially, especially when we go for traditional like that, I mean, contemporary can be a bit cheaper, of course, but this kind of stuff, there is like, you know, marquetry, gilding, bronze, like a lot of different techniques involved. So it's not something you can buy every day. And, and, and you cannot have a lot of clients who, who, who have this incredible Louis XVI console. And, and even if, if they want to, sometimes it's a bit heavy for the taste in, in terms of, of style. So with this wallpaper, I feel like a part of our, you know, of our DNA can reach to actually much more people. And, and to me, it's really, it's really nice to think about that. It's such a great ethos. And as I said, I feel like this collaboration was really a true meeting of the minds. And it, again, is, is so special to talk to you guys and hear a little bit more about the backstory, which, you know, the, again, the, the new the new wallpaper, the classicist sketchbook is so beautiful. But thank you. Thank you both so much for joining us and, and talking a little thank bit more. Us. And to our, our viewers, see you next time. Thank you, guys. Bye. Welcome, I'm Avi Rajagopal, Editor-in-Chief of Metropolis Magazine, and we're here today to talk about healthy spaces and clean surfaces, something we've all been talking about for a long, long, long time now. But the reason we've talking, been talking about it for so long is because the science has shifted and changed our understanding of what makes a space healthy and safe, um, you know, has gone through lots of different trends. There've been lots of questions asked this past year, Sometimes um, the, uh, the best answers are answers that we knew before this pandemic broke. Um, so, you know, we're, we're in this place where we're thinking about health um, so much more deeply today. Um, and so how do we bring that understanding? How, we, how do we bring a science-based approach to the design of interiors? Um, you know, certainly everybody remembers uh, when, you know, people were so excited about, should we put copper in every surface? And, um, you know, people were talking about antimicrobials and bleach cleanable. Now, of course, and then MERV filters were all the rage at some point. So, you know, how do we kind of sort through all of that? And how do we start to apply some of those principles um, in a post-vaccine world, as well as, you know, as we prepare for, for you know, certainly um, what is most likely going to be future um, sort of uh, health challenges uh, in, in our spaces, whether it's workspaces or elsewhere. So let's talk to this amazing group of experts we have today about how we can get some of those basics around healthy design, healthy surfaces, healthy materials, clean surfaces, right. Um, to talk to us today, we have uh, Brittany McNary, who is the interior product project designer and associate at Perkins & Will. Brittany, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for happy to be here. Uh, we have Ryan Johnson, who is the materials researcher with the Healthy Building Network. Ryan, such a pleasure. Happy to be here as well. And Jeffrey Rose, who's the Global Technology Manager at Corium Design. Today's panel discussion is being presented in partnership with DuPont Corium. So thank you so much, DuPont, for making today's discussion possible. I'd like to begin with Brittany. Uh, Brittany, you know, as we were saying, this past year, we've seen so many shifts in terms of what is the best practices for healthy spaces, right? Um, you know, we have standards and we have certifications in the industry, but Certainly, you know, even, even those places have been um, trying to grapple with some of the realities of this pandemic um, and what, might, what it might suggest for the future. So what do you think for better or worse um, out of all those trends is actually going to stick? You know, what are, what are we going to be stuck with or what are we going to be thankful for? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Avi. Uh, for the past year and a half, we've all been focused on our health and well-being. Uh, the pandemic has affected us all, and as a result, we've seen an increased interest and awareness of indoor air quality and improving air filtration in our spaces. Um, that primary focus has been on minimizing risk to COVID, um, but limiting exposure to bacteria in the post-pandemic world 
uh, will continue to be important, especially since companies are aware that their design strategies to address indoor air quality. Um, I think we'll likely continue to see companies searching for buildings and spaces with high performing HVAC systems um, or HVAC systems that can easily be upgraded to provide increased air filtration. Um, the pandemic has also created an increased awareness of those high touch surfaces. Uh, so we've seen a shift of companies incorporating uh, touchless door operators and technology at building and suite entries um, and elevators. So I think as we return to work, um, touchless technology will continue to evolve and become more integrated into spaces, um, both with touchless fixtures for AV controls, um, as well as food service um, and even more. Um, I think that's really interesting. So, you know, uh, the indoor air quality piece, of course, has become so important as we've started to understand how this current virus actually spreads um, and, you know, what is you, what is the sort of largest cause of transmission. You know, for a while, we thought it was surfaces, which is why we invented on wiping down everything for a long time and which is why, you know, antimicrobials and all of that became so um, popular for a little while. Um, but, you know, we still want to, and you're right, we still want to avoid touch. So touchless ID, touchless is certainly um, a trend in that's going to stick around, I think. And then, of course, um, indoor air quality. Um, so thank you so much for that, Brittany. I think those two, those two are the good things that hopefully will stick around after this pandemic um, that we'll be thankful for. We're all thankful for cleaner air. Um, Ryan, Let's talk about the, the other part of this. Um, I'm sure you've been inundated with questions about, you know, um, antimicrobial surfaces or bleach cleanable surfaces. And we know some of those, you know, not, not just from a sustainability point of view, but actually from a human health point of view itself, aren't really that great, right? Um, there's, there's certainly, you know, um, difficulty in terms of, um, rationalizing some of those some of those new developments, even if they are quote unquote FDA approved. So, you know, what should be our approach to material selection at this time? You know, how, how should we approach picking materials for spaces? Yeah, and I think um, when I think about the, the, the way I've, the biggest topic I've thought about in material selection uh, in the last year and a half, it's definitely, you know, antimicrobials are, are certainly what comes to mind. Um, and I think when we see things, we I, first of all, I just I want to recognize that I know there's a lot of people in industry that I think are getting a lot of pressure to add antimicrobials to their products. Uh, just anecdotally, I've, I've heard that, and it's I think both internal and external because people just want to feel like they're living in an environment that is uh, going to make them more healthy. Um, consumers want to feel that way. Um, but I do think there's a big difference between feeling better about what's in your environment and actually being in an environment that is allowing you to be healthier. So when it comes to the idea of, of antimicrobial products, I think first it helps to just understand what they are, um, that they're pesticides, um, they're, they have to be registered with the EPA, um, but a lot of building products just have them anyway. They've historically been used in building products. They, they sort of need to use them as preservatives, for instance, you know, paints uh, have several antimicrobials in them, and, and those are there to protect the product, not the people. And so, so I think like when I, if I'm vetting products that have antimicrobials, I would say, you know, sometimes you're going to see an antimicrobial in a product that sort of is, is there because it's preventing the product from spoilage. Um, where I would draw the line when I'm thinking about, um, you know, what type of product I would recommend using, that's the, the line I would draw would be uh, if there's an antimicrobial added to a product for the purpose of making a health claim or, or an implying a health claim. And, um, you know, certainly um, if there is a health claim that needs to be made, those products have to go undergo a certain type of registration with the EPA. Um, but then I think that taking a step back, you just have to ask yourself, like, what, what does this health claim actually mean? Uh, if you're, on, if you're registering a product with the US EPA and saying that, um, it protects public health. Really, what those uh, tests are designed to do is to show that the, the product is killing uh, some kind of pathogen on a surface. Um, what we don't have is public health studies, epidemiology studies that are actually showing whether or not these 
building products when incorporated into the built environment are leading to healthier populations. Um, the, the one exception which you mentioned earlier would, would be there's a couple studies on copper surfaces. But I think with copper, it's also important to remember that it's a limited resource. Um, it's energy intensive to produce. And even if you're re incorporating recycled material into it, it's it's still, um, there's quite a few environmental concerns related to copper production. So, um, you know, just taking into account that we know there are some antimicrobials that have been used historically that have um, some ha health hazards associated with them. Um, and that there's really no epidemiology studies to, uh, to back up. Any, or basically, the, the studies just haven't been done to show whether or not these things are actually protecting our health. Um, and then also, I would add on top of that, uh, there are certainly studies by people who know a whole lot more about indoor microbial ecology than I do that would suggest that using antimicrobials in the built environment actually could be contributing to antibiotic resistance. Um, and that's a really complex topic. And I think a lot of research is still being done in this area. Um, even research suggesting basically every indoor environment is different. Um, and so, so, so at the end of the day, um, you know, I would just say, if you're vetting products, I, you, you, often there's an antimicrobial option and an option without antimicrobials. And we would kind of guide people to use products that uh, don't have those additional antimicrobials that are there for some other reason other than product preservation. Right, right. Um, you know, I, the approach you're describing, of course, is called precautionary, right? Like, don't right. do more than you have to because the science isn't there yet, you know? So do do just enough. And I think that's, that's in general, even whether we're talking about, you know, environmental impacts or whether we're talking about health impacts, that's usually the, the way to go. I mean, you know, 50 years ago, we all thought asbestos was fine, right? Um, we had a brief period of madness recently where, you know, we were on the verge of maybe permitting asbestos again and then, you know, drew back. I think our, our understanding of materials and sometimes, you know, the, the science, it doesn't become clear around those materials um, for decades, right? And so, you know, it's, it's best to it's best to be cautious in, in what we use. So thanks so much, Ryan. And, and I, I really appreciate your nuance on antimicrobials, knowing that, you know, certain products, you might see them in their, you know, EPD, like environmental product declaration or a declaration of the components. You might see an antimicrobial substance in there, but you have to ask whether that's an addition or whether it's there to protect the product itself from, you know, say, um, fungus or mold or you know bacterial growth or things like that so that's a really important nuance thanks so much for that Ryan. Yeah, um, no and I, should, I forgot to mention there's um, we did work with um, uh, with uh, Perkins and Well and a couple other groups uh, LFI and HPDC and put out a joint statement on antimicrobials kind of summarizes all this in one page that's on mindful materials um, if people are familiar with that website so um, that's a nice succinct resource that's out there as well. Awesome. So if you have any questions about antimicrobials, that's a good place to go. Uh, just go to the Mindful Materials website and you should be able to find it there. Um, if we can find it, we'll put the link in the chat. Um, Jeffrey, uh, I'd like to come to you. So, you know, you're on the other side, you know, of course, um, Brittany is, is as a designer, is, is dealing with materials in space and Ryan advises on, you know, on materials development, but um, you actually help develop materials at Corian. Um, so tell us about how you think about health and, and safety as you're developing materials and, you know, how you use that um, to support wellness, not just for the users, for the folks who live with their materials, but also the folks who, you know, might be installing it, might be producing it, because, you know, materials touch so many human beings across their supply chain. So tell us a little bit about how health is a part of the work that you do, Jeffrey. Sure, yeah, it's a great question. So I'd start at kind of a high level and say this, that when we're talking about developing new products and commercializing them, we are looking really closely at the entire value chain. So not, to your point, not just focusing on the end user and how they interact with the product, which of course is, is extremely important, but looking at every partner along the way. So, you know, uh, transactional customers, um, fabricators, chiefly in our, in our line of work, right? Who's touching the product? What are they doing with it? So specifically for our product lines, we, we look at everything from 
how do you safely transport and handle the material? A lot of our, our products are, are large and heavy. Um, fabricators, what are they doing? You know, how are they manipulating the material to add value? Um, you know, down to the, the installation steps, the, the daily you know, use of the material over years and decades, and then the demolition of the material and the disposal. So we, we truly look at every element every time we do a product development and make sure we understand that. So it's really, um, with that as a lens uh, for product development, it can help inform, you know, really how do we select ingredients to put into our products, right? How do we choose from an array of raw materials to get the functionality we want, um, yet making sure that we're at all, you know, at all possible eliminating hazards um, or at least mitigating, you know, the best we can um, with what we choose to put in the product. Um, but also product format comes into play. I mentioned some of our products are large and, and relatively dense. You know, we always look at ways of what's the ideal format, right, as we take it through the value chain. Um, so we, we do that and use this lens because, again, we want to mitigate uh, whatever hazards um, we can upfront, right? Not deal with it later, but really build it into the product design. So that's kind of um, that, that's kind of one point. Another is that, you know, in addition to focusing on product design and how the value chain and all the entities of the value chain play in, um, we do look at technical support. So we come out with a product or product line. And how are we supporting that, right? And not, and I don't mean you know disclaimers and stickers on the back that say a few things that people ignore, but you know what's the the technical documentation? Uh, sometimes video content, sometimes training that really is um, you know helping again everyone involved in the value chain um, transport the material safely, fabricate it safely, and so forth. On the the end user side, so those who are you know they have the final install product and they're the ones enjoying it uh, day over day. Um, it's really probably more on the code body side. So we, we, you know, we select into what code body, what regulations we want to follow, we want to be a part of, and we want to make sure we're certified and audited against. So that includes things like uh, food contact safety, um, NSF 51. It includes um, Green Guard certification for low VOC emission. It can include um, fire ratings. Um, it can include, you know, microbial growth control, things like that. So that's um, really more at the end user side of, of how we kind of self-regulate and make sure that we're, we're really upholding uh, the core values of our company. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish with one other point really around, you know, that's kind of, we have an idea, we're going to go forward. How do we, you know, control things? Um, how do we select what we're going to work on? So um, I think for that, of course, we, we listen intently to our customers, almost obsessively to our customers, you know, what are their challenges? Um, what do they need? What problems are they trying to solve? And how can we help, you know, in the, in the design space? Um, but, you know, of course, we bring a scientific approach. So we, we, we listen hard and then we, we really look at things, again, with a scientific lens and say, you know, we, we may down select something, uh, we, we may, you know, move off of something, even if it's kind of what the customer is signaling, what the trends are saying. And a perfect example is what Ryan was talking about is the inclusion of antimicrobials and services. So this has been, you know, ostensibly like the go to, you know, maneuver <laughs> to say, hey, look, we have a new product. It's better, it's safer, it's, it's more hygienic because it has an antimicrobial in there um, that's gonna do all this action. So, you know, we've looked very carefully at what's out there. We looked at, you know, what the CDC says and what research says and, and just the view of this. And, and we, we share um, what, um, you know, what Ryan, what Ryan talked about in terms of a cautionary approach. Um, we, we believe that we cannot at this point manufacture a product that's safe and effective um, if we, we use that maneuver and include an antimicrobial. So um, I hope I kind of touched on again, high level, um, uh, you know, how we execute what we want to produce, but then also talk about, you know, how we, how we guide what we're actually going to go off and do. So. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. You know, I think it's really important to have all of those sort of safeguards, but also, you know, touch points um, coming back to, you know, what is the science, what is the local guidance, you know, but also who, who is going to be impacted by the decision you make at every stage of the process, you know, of, of um, developing new materials. Um, I think, you know, Brittany, you, you set us off on that big picture talking about, you know, how we now care about indoor air quality and how, you know, air um, has been one of the things we, we've paid, we started to pay the most attention to as a result of this pandemic. It wasn't how we started out, at the, you know, in March last year, but certainly, you know, as the science has built up, we've understood that you know, air quality is the most important thing. Um, and I just want to say, you know, when Jeffrey brought up Green Guard Gold, you know, we also have to think about air quality um, in terms of air circulation, but also off-gassing and VOCs and all of that, all of the, you know, other stuff that we might be inadvertently putting into the space and creating more of a load for those air purification systems as well. So, you know, really important to think about air. Um, and, you know, when it comes to touch, Brittany, you brought up touchless surfaces and, 
or, or touchless devices and, and things like that. And certainly some of those are going to be important to inspire more confidence in people as we return to work or return to healthcare spaces and other places like that. But you know, high touch surfaces, one of the biggest trends as, as um, you know, Ryan brought up is, is antimicrobials. And you know, certainly the science on that is, is um, suspect at best. And you know, we, it, it suggests that we need to take a more fundamentals approach, right? Not go, not, not go with the latest fad at the moment, just because we don't know what unintended harm we might be causing by the decisions we make today. And so, you know, again, Jeffrey, that back to basics approach that you talked about, right? Just thinking through every stage and thinking about not just the impact that, you know, an addition like antimicrobials or, or something like that is going to have on the people who actually use the state, but also all the people in the supply chain, all the folks who actually have to handle those chemicals and put them into the product, um, who have to deal with it when you throw the product away. Um, you know, so, so understanding that the decisions we make as designers are not just going to impact the lives of end users, but actually have a, have a huge impact on the entire supply chain of whatever products and materials that we choose to work with. So that's really important. So thank you so much for laying out that landscape. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I want to talk about sort of, um, uh, you know, toxicity, red lists and precautionary lists. So, you know, we know that certain materials are certain chemicals or certain chemistries uh, are not great for human health, uh, even though they're commonly used in, in products. And we've seen over the past you know, few years, um, many of those materials be taken out of building products and interior products because of those concerns. You know, a good example is phthalates, which were used in, you know, in vinyl products. And now most vinyl products are phthalate free. Um, vinyl has other problems, but phthalate is not one of them anymore, just because you know, that's been, um, you know, there's, there's so much awareness about you know, the endocrine disorders and other things that, that chemical can cause. There's lots of red lists like that, but it's hard to keep track of those things. It's hard to kind of, you know, um, figure out what is the approach to take towards materials like that, that may end up causing that you're putting in a space because they're high performance or they're easily cleaned, but, you know, at the end of the day, they might end up causing more harm than good. So can you talk about how designers can keep track of, of science? I mean, designers are not chemists. Um, you know, they're not, they're not trained to deal with chemistry all the time. Um, how can we, how can designers take better care of the kinds of materials and products that they put into spaces? Um, I'd love to start with that and then we'll start taking some audience questions as they come in. Sure, yeah, I, um, yeah, I can start with that one. Um, I, I think as designers, um, it's important for us to make sure that as we're um, researching materials that we're gonna specify that we request transparency documentation that's fully disclosed from manufacturers. And that transparency documentation that's uh, in the form of health product declaratives or health product declarations or HPDs. Um, and manufacturers have gotten a lot better um, about providing HPDs. Um, but as designers, it's really our responsibility to, to make sure that we're doing our due diligence and reviewing those HPDs to, um, to make sure that there aren't any ingredients that are undisclosed. Um, and in those instances, when undisclosed ingredients are listed, it's important for us to, to go back to the manufacturer and um, ask uh, what that ingredient is, how it's being used in their product, um, as well as uh, vetting the ingredients that are shown on the HPD against the precautionary list um, or uh, the red list. And Perkins and Will has um, a transparency site with the precautionary list uh, that's publicly available to anyone that's interested in um, understanding the relationship of the built environment and our health. And the site lists hazardous substances um, where they're commonly found in the built environment, as well as alternatives to look for uh, when you're specifying products. So I think as we navigate our way out of the pandemic, it's still critical that we create the demand in the industry for material transparency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. And I, I would also add to that, if you're looking at those transparency documents, I think you, you, you kind of alluded to this, Brittany, but you know, if it's characterized identified screens down to 100 parts per million, great, 1000 parts per million, you know, is, is good too, but maybe not quite as good. But the, what that's telling you is that, um, you know, they've, they've actually uh, kind of listed every function in that product. And if it's, and, and it's, um, and they've identified what those chemicals are, but also that they, they have screened the, those, those chemicals against some authoritative hazard lists. Um, 
and uh, and uh, I think that's uh, you know it's a great start. And and we we also um, have some tools in our database, uh, in our Ferros database. Um, you know, if people want to screen things against, um, you know, they know what those chemicals are, and and they're not sure if they're showing up on one of, uh, on some additional restricted substances lists. People can always go and use that tool and, and see that as well. Um, Jeffrey, from Korean's point of view, is there anything that you know designers need to what should designers keep track of when they're looking at surface materials, for instance? I'd say I was listening um, as uh, Brittany was responding, uh, exactly the same answer, right? It's about transparency documents. It's about manufacturers being upfront with, here is what is in our product, right? There, there's nothing to hide. This is what, what constitutes the product um, and just putting it out there. And I think it's, um, I'm, I'm proud of, of Coring Design and DuPont because I think we, we really were pretty early um, at least in Korean design on, you know, recognizing that, oh, these are important documents. This is a methodology, you know, in a way that we can uh, formally communicate, you know, what our customers, you know, even if they're not asking what they probably should care about um, and, and not to the point of, uh, you know, we're, we're losing sales competitors who have done it first or we're being begged for documents. Like, I think we're, we're usually um, pretty far ahead on these um, and willing to do it. And I think that they're, um, they're necessary, but also they, I like having these internally because when we look at these, we can, it's better, it helps us to judge ourselves, right? Like, okay, are, are, are there things that we, you know, could, could we formulate around? Are we, you know, they're not on a red list, of course, but, you know, do we, do we have a sense that, you know, at, at some point in the future, is this kind of like this other compound that, that perhaps it has an issue? Um, and, and I'll say the EPD is similar, right? We can look at, you know, what, what's, what's the embodied carbon, like what goes into making our product and, and you know, where are points of we'd, we'd want to improve over time. So, um, I think it's absolutely the manufacturer's responsibility to be transparent, and, and these are great examples of documents that, that help us do that. Um, you know, related to that, um, one of the reasons why a lot of you know treatments or finishes or different um, sort of chemicals make their way into our products is also about how they're going to be clean. And you know, I hear a lot of talk in the industry about this theater of hygiene. I don't know if you guys have heard that term, right? It's like um, there's a lot of talk that, you know, when, especially among like building owners and facility managers and uh, designers who are listening in, if you've heard that term too, I'd love to hear what you think about it. You know, there's this idea that, you know, somehow when folks come back into the office, they should see people wiping everything down and like, you know, um, mopping the floor and keeping things clean, you know, in a very visible way, almost like a, like a, you know, a theatrical performance. Um, but that makes me think about this vicious cycle between, you know, frequent cleaning and strength of materials, right? Um, the uh, like, the you you put more materials into um, you put you clean materials more because you know they can stand up to it, and then you know materials have to get stronger because they're being cleaned so often, and like it's just it's just it just keeps feeding itself, um, and you know the more harsher, especially in healthcare, the more harsh the cleaning agents are, the more kind of harsh the material components have to be, and none of that is good for us or our health. Um, so let's talk a little bit about cleaning protocols. Um, you know, how do you react to this idea of a theater of hygiene? Um, you know, how are you thinking about, um, you know, how spaces are cleaned and maintained um, as, as people in the design industry? Yeah, I, um... I, I think it's a little interesting um, and kind of goes back to one of the comments that was made at the beginning about just kind of perception um, versus reality. And so I think um, kind of the theater of cleaning, it, it goes to people maybe wanting to feel more comfortable in spaces as they return to work and, and seeing that those spaces are clean. But um, I think a part of that cleaning protocol is um, companies kind of clearly um, notifying and letting their employees know like what the cleaning and kind of maintenance protocols are. So there isn't necessarily that need to see that action happening in the space. Um, I think it's also important for us to kind of think about um, what materials actually do really need to be um, incredibly durable. So which, which services do we actually really need to be cleaning daily um, and, and kind of looking at the cleaning protocol through that lens. Um, as well as the the lens of the cleaning product itself that's being used and what that impact will be to the um, indoor air quality of the space. Ryan or Jeffrey, anything anything that you guys are thinking about in terms of cleaning protocol? I'll add again, the, I think the manufacturer's responsibility for, again, manufacturers like us who sell into the design space, into interiors, um, is, is around one, having a robust product, right, that can stand up to rigorous cleaning, 
how are you to find that? But but again, being transparent about you know um, here here are common you know disinfectants and sterilants that might be used in healthcare, um, and here's how our product stands up. You know, and and and, and show if there are any gaps of you know this unfortunately needs to be avoided, but. Here's a here's a good list of things that we have tested and we we think um, are, are you know going to work well. So just mention again, manufacturer's responsibility on being clear about um, here's our product and here's how it will behave in your environment. And here's what you can expect from it in terms of cleaning, disinfection, sterilization. I think too, and uh, Jeffrey, that actually reminded me of something else. But I think um, it's also important as designers too to make sure that we're having conversations with our owners and with um, with clients as we specify products to let them know what those, um, what the manufacturer recommendations are for cleaning and for maintenance. Uh, so that they're one aware, um, just from kind of a, a warranty and durability standpoint uh, of what that product can actually maintain. Uh, so it's not really a surprise to them in the end um, when they do go back through to, to start cleaning and, and doing that maintenance as well. Right, right. Yeah, and I, I think, um... It would be interesting to to see how you know some of the, you talk about the the theater of hygiene how this these cleaning protocol are standing up to what might be recommended by manufacturers. Um, I, I think when I think about cleaning, I think about not overdoing it. Um, it does seem to be another area where people have this more is better mentality, um, and you know rightly so. Like COVID nineteen when it hit, we it was it was scary for everybody. Um, but I think what's interesting, you know, the CDC has some interesting guidance on cleaning um, that they've been updating regularly, specifically related to COVID-19. And um, they do seem to be implying, like, in a lot of cases, less is better. Um, and, and I think that there's also, when we just think about the chemicals that we're using to clean, there's often times that we just don't need to be using the, the really harsh chemicals um, in a lot of environments that, you know, we don't have to be using bleach on everything. Um, and I think uh, when, when it comes to healthcare, you know, healthcare without harm has some really great resources on this. Um, you know, uh, Tori, the Toxics Use Reduction Institute uh, of University Massachusetts Lowell. I know they have um, they have gone through the EPA's list N. Um, that's the chemicals that are uh, cleaning products that are supposed to be effective against COVID-19, and they've they've identified safer ingredients there. Um, you know, there's there's a couple green seal certifications for safer cleaning products. So there's just there's just a lot of ways that we can be thinking about when we are cleaning. Maybe not not maybe the frequency isn't that that's happening isn't required. But then also um, there's probably a lot of cases where we could be using something that's very effective um, and and less toxic. And there seems to be a lot of resources out there on, in this regard. Yeah, and I think um, the CDC specifically backed off a little bit and said, "Hey, look, you know, a good soap or detergent, right, is is really effective, right? That the fact that it should be your first step anyway, right? Remove, you know, debris and biofilm, and, and then you may want to use disinfectant. But yeah, especially with with SARS-CoV-2, right? It, it's it's just it, it's easy. It's actually easy to eradicate on a surface with a really good surfactant. So yeah, I, I like uh, you know, don't use something stronger, more." Um, aggressive than you need to. The other thing too, I think with over cleaning is uh, the more it's a burden and a hassle, um, the quality, you know, you can imagine probably goes down. Okay, we're doing this a lot. So every time you do it, um, you know, kind of just do it quickly. The other part too is ideally when you, you know, you wipe a quat salt or something right on a surface, great, you know, disinfectant for most things. Um, ideally you're wiping it off, right? With, um, you know, you're, you're trying to remove it after it does its action. But again, if you're cleaning all day long because it, that's what you think looks good or what's needed, um, then you're not going to do that. Now, all of a sudden, you have more interaction with people and the disinfectant that uh, you know you probably don't need. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I, you know, as with as with everything, you know, it's really about taking a step back, taking a breath, finding out what the guidelines are, um, and kind of you know not doing more than you need to. Um, so you know, this theater of hygiene um, is not not always a great thing. Talking about not doing too much, uh, we have an interesting perspective here from an audience member. Um, Daniel Grafman says, is a healthy space regarding microbes simply a sanitized space or one that mimics healthy biomes? So are, might we be doing harm by trying to kill every single microorganism that's, that's in a space? Um, do we really need this you know, ultra-filtered air, um, totally microbe-free surfaces, and is that even healthy for us? So I don't know if any of you have any perspectives on that. Um, I'd love to hear a reaction or two. 
I, I've read about things in this space and, and an interesting tipping point of totally eradicating the biome, right? Um, versus, you know, going the other way, not doing anything, and, and you have free, free, you know, C. difficile everywhere, for example. So I don't have a great answer other than I've read it. I find it very interesting, um, and it's a great point. You know, at this point, we'll, I'll be clear that we are, you know, following general guidance of cleaning and disinfection is your best course, um, at least in sensitive spaces like healthcare. So, um, you know, should you eradicate all, you know, everything on all surfaces everywhere? <laughs> you know, that's probably overkill. Um, in healthcare, I still think, um, it, it's probably critical to, to really, um, you know, go after in a kind of in a total eradication mode to get at things like MRSA, C. difficile, C. Oris, and things like that, that are, are truly deadly and are, are, are very problematic, um, to find a way where you could somehow balance, um, and have, you know, the presence, still the presence of a healthy biome, um, keep everyone's immune systems in tune. That's ideal. I just think, um, at this point, at least in healthcare, um, the kind of brute force kill all <laughs> to, to get rid of the really nasty things is, is probably the way to go, my opinion. Yeah, I think you um, bring up a great point about balance and and knowing that it's it's maybe not necessary to eliminate everything, but um, we do want to make sure that we are addressing um, those things that we know are causing harm or that can cause harm. Uh, and so just kind of being mindful about what you're doing and, and not necessarily um, going all the way to, to the end of the spectrum in terms of um, in terms of cleaning. The best article I've found on this, and it's it's a pretty dense article, I'll be honest. Like so so it's um just to make that caveat, but uh, it has some good graphics in it that kind of sort of talk about this topic broadly and, and about the topic of indoor microbial ecology. And and it, it does get at the point of that point of there's a lot of there's some bad bacteria, there's some good ones, and there's a bunch of kind of, you know, in between too, they're, they're sort of there. And, and uh, I, I think uh, this is the one I've felt um, kind of address, addresses the topic uh, best. And, um, you know, it gets into some pretty uh, technical biology, but uh, I find it to be fascinating. Jeffrey, I, I definitely want to emphasize that healthcare is a little bit of a, of a special case, right? Um, those are protected environments, they have a very special purpose. And we know that, you know, we certainly don't want to go back to the era where hospital acquired infections were killing more people than the infections that they were coming into the hospital with. Um, so, you know, we, we, we don't want that, certainly. Um, but, you know, it's also, I think, there's been a rush to, to take standards that are in the healthcare space and then apply them to other spaces, which, you know, is definitely a bit of an overkill um, and, and something that we should guard against. A quick question for, for Jeffrey, Richard Brown asks, is Corian bleach cleanable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Corian tile surface, Corian quartz, Corian Endura are three main products, uh, including Corian sinks, um, are bleach cleanable. So not porous resistant to, you know, caustic such as, such as bleach. Uh, we do have guidance, corian.com, um, in our technical, technical documentation on, you know, the best methods, uh, dilution uh, ratios and things like that. So uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'd like to come back um, to the, the point that Brittany raised right at the start of this conversation, which is indoor air quality. So can, can we talk a little bit just about the broader context of, of, um, of healthy air? Um, and I think Brittany, from your point of view, just can we talk about sort of how you're thinking about air quality or how your colleagues at Perkins and Will are thinking about air quality at this point in time? Um, and then um, Ryan and Jeffrey, maybe, um, the interplay between materials and air quality, just, just some of the basics on that, if we can. Yeah, um, I mean, over, over the past year, we have seen uh, just kind of an increase in client requests and wanting to understand um, what are the different design strategies available to them uh, that we might be able to implement to address um, improved air quality. Um, so we have seen uh, a shift to uh, request to add UVC air filtration, uh, as well as the, the MERV filtration uh, that you had mentioned at the beginning of this as well. Um, and we are still designing uh, to just kind of the, the general best practice and, and making sure that um, the filtration that we have at a, at a bare minimum, that it's meeting um, the ASHRAE baseline standards that are um, out there, but then wanting to make sure that the, when we have control over the, the base building systems, making sure that those 
um, have the capability to be upgraded should our clients or owners uh, decide that they do want to increase filtration over the course of, um, of their building or their um, spaces lease. And so that's, that's one of the, the ways to approach it as well. When I think about indoor air quality, um, you know, certainly I work with materials. So I, I come at it from that perspective. And I think um, there's a couple of things to think about. Um, you know, one, certainly it's great to have uh, CDPH certification, uh, which Green Guard Gold is one of the ways to get that. Um, that is looking at very specific uh, chemicals with chronic health effects in California. There's there's other things that it's not measuring. Um, so, so it's really important to kind of also be thinking, uh, taking a precautionary approach um, at what's in your material um, outside of that. Uh, well, but though it is, I mean, it's great certification. Um, the, the other thing is, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's things that are not volatile organic compounds that still affect the indoor air quality that are in materials, semi-volatiles, you know, you mentioned phthalates and while well, those are not in, um, a lot of vinyl flooring products have removed those. There are, there are other vinyl products that still are using, you know, higher molecular weight phthalates. And, and the, the, the topic of semi-volatile organic compounds can get really complex really fast and what's getting in the dust um, and what's, you know, you, you get into like uh, the, the skin oils that are, you know, accumulating on everything, every surface of your house. Um, so, so I guess the, just, again, kind of broken record here, but thinking about removing the source of any potential source of pollution um, and taking that precautionary approach and, and thinking really, um, uh, you know, at that life cycle of that product and thinking about um, just not using anything that we, we have reason to believe could be causing us harm in that product. Um, so from a materials perspective, that's how I look at it. It's just removing the source altogether, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially as we're thinking about energy efficiency. And that's a topic that always comes up alongside with indoor air quality, right? Um, as we increase energy efficiency, we build tighter buildings and, and we have indoor air quality issues. Jeffrey, anything from, um, from Corian's perspective in terms of um, yeah, we don't under our quality. Yeah. Sure. So we don't really have a stake in, in you know, filtration or kind of proactively managing indoor air quality. I'd say that our um, our role is really products that do no harm to indoor air quality. So like I mentioned, Green Guard certification, low VOC. Um, but even the, the point that um, that Ryan was making, um, I, I think we have a general uh, philosophy in manufacturing of wherever we can make something an ingredient totally reactive. It's it's part of the composite. It's not you know left to be an oligomer or something that's it's even you know, partially volatile, um, we try to go that direction. It, it, we can't exclusively do that, but it is a view of, wow, if you have something that's just completely reacted, it's super high molecular weight, it can't go anywhere, uh, we, we realize that that's always going to be the better case. So that, that's all I'll add. Uh, I'm going to ask a pretty big question coming up. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, standards around wellness, and of course, the healthy building movement um, in the design industry has, has really grown by leaps and bounds. Um, we have sort of certifications like the Well Building Standard or FitWell, or more recently the Well Health and Safety Rating. Um, you know, there's there's definitely standards and certifications out there, and they all look at space in this really you know holistic kind of way. So you know, when we talk about something like indoor air quality or or materials, already we start to see how those two things have a connection, right? Um, and so the needs of any space in terms of you know, how it stays healthy is such a complex kind of, um, you know, kind of combination of factors. So, yeah. you know, I just want to understand, I just want to hear from you sort of maybe um, how you think about A, maybe those certification systems or just thinking about holistically in terms of wellness in a, in a space, um, you know, moving a little bit beyond protecting people from infection but rather also um, supporting good health and wellness over time. So, you know, not just in terms of, okay, let's make sure people don't fall sick, but rather how do we make sure people stay healthy, right? Um, so any, any sort of bigger level thoughts on that would be great. As, as you mentioned, the, the well-building standard, I think it does a great job of, of holistically looking at spaces and their impact on the, the human body. And 
coming out of the pandemic, like, yes, we've, we've been talking a lot about cleanability and about protocol, but I think there's also over the past 18 months, we've also really just been focused on physical and, and even mental health a bit. And so I think, uh, while it does a great job, um, just through their, um, through their mind features on some of the nourishment features that they have uh, in their standard, they do a great job of looking holistically at spaces, both at uh, the organization's policies, um, as well as what's physically in the space um, and in the built environment to help address um, the, the impact that the built environment has on, um, on people's health as a whole. Um, but I, I think we're still going to, to continue seeing um, just kind of maybe an added interest in companies wanting uh, designers to make sure that spaces are not only addressing uh, just kind of spatially what those needs, what their, what their needs are, um, but wanting to understand how they can actually um, help improve um, kind of mental, um, mental health as well. I think our, um, our view on this, our role, so we talked about you know, our product lines as, as being functional in terms of hygiene, they're non-porous, they're bleach cleanable and so on. Um, but, you know, we, were, we, were, we focus on aesthetics, of course, right? So we, we sell not only products that we're, we're trying to hit aesthetic trends, trying to create certain environments through the aesthetics, um, but also even in design, how you can manipulate the product and have, you know, uh, curve features and backlighting and things like that. So I think we can contribute to overall, you know, healthy spaces by having, you know, things that are attractive that can be, uh, that can be soft, that can be, you know, almost healing. Um, so I think in addition to a functional, you know, product lines, we, we, of course, were in the business of aesthetics and we, we try to um, you know, provide architects and designers, um, you know, what they're looking for uh, in regards to that. Jeffrey, how do we think about sort of health holistically um, within interior design? That's, that, that's a big question. Um, you know, I, I think it is, this might be a little tangential to what you're getting at, but, but just kind of going off of, you know, the, the well standard question. Um, you know, a lot of the work we do is working with uh, uh, people in the affordable housing community. And so, you know, sometimes something like well or lead is going to be, you know, th those are, you, you have to pay a lot of money to get certified under those um, certifications. And so, um, so I think, I think there's a lot we can do, you know, like those can be good. There can be a lot of good, um, I mean, the, the, the spirit of those certifications is great. Right, but um, there can be a lot that we can do, you know, outside of certifying a building to um, any one of these certifications, and and um, and I think that uh, you know when you're when you're looking at material selection, you know, uh, m maybe I'll just uh, shamelessly promote you know one of our tools here. You know, we have our our hazard spectrum, uh, hazard spectra. That is uh, where we kind of just. Um, we look at those things. We look at um, from a material selection perspective, um, what what um, what materials are going to have the most um, you know human health and environmental hazards associated with them. And we do consider things like the upstream and the the manufacturing process and that. So we are considering things like occupational exposures um, and exposures to people when they're installing products um, and uh, exposures that might occur to fence line communities when these things are um, being manufactured. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's one way, you know, that we kind of just um, think about uh, products that have a high impact because they're just used a lot. So like flooring or insulation are the products that are used all over your building. Um, mm -hmm. So, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're getting at with your question, um, but um, no, definitely. You know, I yeah, I, I I actually I think I know I see where you're getting at, um, Ryan. You know, the when we think about health, you know, we have to think about health holistically, not just in terms of all the elements of health, but also you know, what at what levels can we have you know the most impact, right? So it's not just about you know maybe going for full certification or you know all of that, but really understanding you know what are some of those basic things that we can do to to you know support people um, no matter no matter what kind of space it is, no matter you know what their sort of um, ability to afford certain materials or certain certain measures might be, um, you know, and I think that kind of lot like so it's a, it's holistic thinking, not just in terms of 
you know, um, mental health and physical health and all of those attributes as, as Brittany brought up. Um, and, you know, not just in terms of, you know, supply chain as, um, as Jeffrey brought up and you brought up as well, but rather, you know, thinking of it in terms of also a different sections of society, different, you know, different groups of people thinking about, you know, um, affordable housing as much as we do about healthcare, think about corporate offices as much as we do as people's homes um, and kind of understanding that it's still the same individuals who travel from their apartment to an office, to a hospital, to a hotel, right? And that, you know, health outcomes um, are formed within those communities. And, you know, so if somebody is living in a building that, that is not supporting their health, not much that you can do in the office is going to change their life, right? Um, and that somehow those two have to go together. And in, by the same thing, you know, a person who's working in an unhealthy work environment um, can't be healthy just because their home is, you know, is um, is taken care of from a health and wellness point of view. So, you know, there's a there's just a, a we have to think about holistically in terms of also that people have full lives. <laughs> um, right. Some great comments in here, uh, some quick questions as well. Um, Wendy is prompting us to talk a little bit about the outdoors, um, and I think that's great. You know, um, can we talk about, um, you know, looking at um, outdoor outdoors and as an element of health? I mean, certainly a lot of, there was that trend as well. It was like, well, why don't we work outdoors? Why don't we open up buildings? Why don't we have, you know, like, um, you know, operable windows everywhere and so on. And, and certainly there's some limits to that kind of thinking, but let's talk about, you know, being more open to the outdoors um, and, you know, A, how that, uh, I think, Brittany, from your point of view, are you seeing that more of that integration or, or kind of talk about that integration? Ryan, from where, your point of view, you know, what are some concerns around outdoor materials? And, and you know, is that something that, you know, um, you might have some viewpoints on and um, Jeffrey, of course, thinking about sort of, you know, indoor, outdoor transitional materials as well, things that can, you know, work as well indoors and outdoors. So let's just talk, talk a little bit about outdoors um, as, as maybe some of our last comments on this conversation. Um, I think just in terms of kind of overall design strategies to, um, to promote the outdoors and um, kind of providing providing access to the outdoors when maybe you don't necessarily have that chance to, to actually um, have a hard connection between the outdoor space and the interior space. Um, one of the things that you can make sure that you're doing is um, providing access to views uh, so that you are able to see, uh, you're able to see outdoors when you're in that interior space or locating some of the spaces that are more collaborative or serve as kind of meeting spaces within um, within workspaces, making sure that those are located along the windows so that um, the design overall is equitable and everyone really has a chance to experience those spaces that do have that connection to the outdoors. Um, another great resource too is um, Bill Browning's 14 Patterns of Biophilic Design. Uh, and so that's one way that you can actually incorporate, um, and we do this a lot, is just um, by incorporating biophilic patterns um, into our spaces. So um, either with kind of directly with uh, water features or with plants, but then also um, pulling some of the abstracted patterns from nature um, into the space, which allows you to um, break up uh, some of the, the tension that your eyes get when you're um, kind of focusing and, and staring intently at a computer screen. If there's a, kind of a biophilic pattern uh, that you can shift your eyes to that'll help um, kind of relax your eyes and provide you with the benefits of um, being outdoors but while you're still on the interior and so I think just from um, from a design from a design standpoint there are a couple different ways that you can look at um, incorporating the outdoors into your spaces um, if you don't necessarily even have that um, have that opportunity to have a physical connection to the outdoors. I think if we're thinking about from a material health perspective, uh, materials designed for outdoor spaces, you know, by nature, they're going to have to have properties that you don't necessarily need uh, if you're using a material for indoor spaces because they're exposed to the elements. So you need things to help them, you know, be more resilient against sunlight and, 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 and wind and rain, right? And so, um, you know, one thing that I think about, um, I've, I've 
I've looked more at indoor materials than outdoor, but the outdoor materials that I have looked at, you know, certainly there's, there's uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, is uh, you know, PFAS, the forever chemicals. So, uh, you know, they, they tend to be used in certain coatings um, that can be used on the building envelope. Uh, they can be used in, uh, you know, concrete sealers, uh, things of that sort. And, and so <clears throat> uh, I think that's the kind of thing to, that is, you know, maybe more concerning from a material health perspective is, is um, you know, identifying materials that are, they're not using chemicals that, uh, that are, you know, the forever chemicals that are, that are, um, that have health concerns associated with them just as an entire class of chemicals like that. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is kind of different, but um, you mentioned opening windows and, and certainly um, you know, fresh air intake is, is a huge thing. Um, and, and that's great when you have fresh air, you know, fresh air, when you have air that you want to breathe. But if you are thinking about a, a product from a whole life you know, cycle perspective, uh, you got to think about the people living near those you know, petroleum refineries that have repeat violations, right? And so um, there are places where um, people maybe don't want to open their windows, and they and, and so uh, that's another thing to be thinking about. And that type of information can be really, really hard to get at. Um, I, I I wish there was like a, a an easy way um, to to say you know to vet materials based on these up stream life cycle uh, things. And, and you know, we, we've, we've done that to a degree with some things and have some of that information in our tools, but, but um, it can be really hard to find that information. So I think it's a complex issue. Quickly, again, I think our role here is um, helping to, you know, create outdoor spaces, providing, again, the right products that can be positioned outside, you know, bring the hygienic benefits, bring the, you know, the beauty um, and other and other functionalities, and then again, a, a part about transparency of you know hey, these products are superior. This is what you can expect in ten years. This is what this will product will look like in ten years um, versus this product, which you you know you can use, but you could expect more of a color shift, for example. So I think it's about you know designing products that can work outdoors to build outdoor spaces, um, and then being transparent about how we expect them to perform over time and you know in an accelerated sense. Um. Thanks so much for that. You know, we're used to thinking about indoor environments and this is, you know, a, a legacy of, you know, the last 50 years of how we've built buildings. We used to think of indoor environments as protected environments and outdoor environments as sort of exposed environments. And to some extent that's true. And yet, you know, as we were talking about, you know, biomes and I, and thank you so much for sharing that BOI article, um, Ryan. Um, as we're thinking about biomes, you know, we have to understand that there's, that we live with, with microbes, we live with all kinds of things indoors as well. And you know, there's 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 no there's no perfectly hermetically sealed environment on this planet, really, um, except for very extreme conditions. Um, and so, you know, we, to some extent, we have to think about the interplay of air and material and human beings all the time. Um, and the pandemic has just kind of reinforce that and I think that's at the heart of some of the basics of healthy thinking you know on that foundation then we build you know things like um, you know access to views Brittany as you were saying or um, you know biophilia aesthetics as you were bringing up Jeffrey you know we 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 can then on that foundation where we where we've tried to mitigate as much harm as we can build the foundation of you know now nurturing and supporting and helping people you know, feel comfortable, feel safe, and be healthy in spaces. So, you know, I think there's a there's a layered approach here. And you know, as Ryan, you were saying, there's there's many different levels at which you can tackle the the the, the problem. Um, it is very complex, um, but I think there's there's an entry point for almost anyone um, into you know how to create healthy spaces. So, um, thank you all so much, Brittany, um, Ryan, and Jeffrey, for all your um, input today. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you to our audience for, for listening to us. Um, and I hope you, know, you will stay in touch with us and, and let's continue the conversation. This conversation about health, of course, doesn't, didn't start today, it doesn't end today. Um, you know, it's a movement that, that we're all part of. And you know, ultimately, um, you know, it's one of the most important, one important goals we have as designers um, is to you know, safeguard the health of not just the individuals who use our spaces, but also the communities who we impact through our work, whether it's through specification or through other means. So thank you all so much again for, for joining us today. I hope you have a great afternoon.
Um, and um, I hope you all stay healthy. Thank you. <laughs>